All right, Matteo Jorgensen, welcome to the channel. Thank you. Good to have hey. you on here. Cheers. All right, so for those of you that don't know, Matteo, he was also in Criterium de Dauphiné, finished 13th overall, and your best result so far in your cycling career, would you say Paris 8th overall? Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, for sure. All right, so Matteo, how would you describe yourself as a rider, first of all? Yeah, starting off with the hardest one, I think. <laughs> uh, I think I'm starting to become more of like a guy that focuses on climbs yeah uh, which is funny i mean i say like i'm starting to become more of that but yeah. like as a junior that's what i was i was a climber yeah, yeah it's just that in the last few years i've kind of like my body's grown and yeah i got a lot taller got a lot wider yeah. heavier so yeah i've kind of like for a few years i kind of lost that dream and yeah now i'm kind of seeing Maybe I can do it as long as the climbs aren't super hard or whatever. Like I, maybe I could do a one week stage races GC yeah. or with their, with only like one mountaintop finish day. Yeah, absolutely. Your results say that so far. So that's awesome. Next question. So much like Australia, it's a different process, obviously becoming pro. Like you don't just grow up with your mum and dad and live and race there. So what was your process like becoming pro from America? Yeah, for sure. It's hard. Uh, I didn't make it on action, which is like the go-to way for Americans to yeah. go pro. Um, yeah, I just wasn't a super good junior and they didn't, they didn't take me. So I, I, <laughs> I mean, that's just it, honestly. And uh, yeah, I, I ended up having to come to Europe and my first year I was on, I went, I signed for like a continental team, Jelly yeah. Belly in the U.S., but basically, I told the team, like, I want to spend the whole year in Europe with the yeah. national team if I could. And they let me, thankfully, they gave me a bike and some kit. And, um, yeah, I spent, like, the whole year with the national team, yeah. or the whole spring with the national team. And then I did some summer races, too. And thankfully, yeah, I had a good enough results there to, like, through some, you know, sending emails and stuff, I was, I was good enough to make it on Chambry, which yeah. was a big step. And then I could live in Europe full time. and. So on Chambéry, how did you find it? Obviously, being an American, like learning a foreign language, it's not like you yeah. just pick up the language immediately. So surely, no. like, there's a mm -mm. a huge barrier there, and obviously, you just when you're so young as well, it's something that is completely out of the ordinary to do. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I mean, I for me, I knew like that that would be the most key thing would be to learn French. Yeah. When I got to Chambéry, so I actually spent like a good few months before I left for France, like studying pretty hard. And then when I got there, they were putting us through French school. Like they would yeah, pay for yeah. us to go every morning to French school. So it's like you could either half ass it and like go there and just like sit there and just think about it as like a requirement that you have to do. Yeah. And that's what I saw. Like a lot of the guys, like the international guys were doing that were on the team before me. But like, they're also just paying for you to go to school and like yeah. you have nothing else to do. Like you might as well take full advantage. And so I kind of got stuck in and like, yeah, really try hard to learn French. And like within three months I spoke decent French. And I think like I could at least have like a connection with all of my teammates within three yeah. months, which, which helped a ton. Like if you don't have that, you just end up being really socially, like it's just a hard year. And yeah. So it helped me a ton. And was it at that point where you learnt the language and you integrated with the team in Europe that, like, you felt you could be pro? Or was it, like, before that, earlier on in your oh, career? Yeah. Or? No, no, definitely it was then. Uh, once I, like, kind of integrated with the team, then results started coming. Like, those first few months I was there, I was, like, so stressed with life and going yeah. to school and all this shit that I didn't perform well. Uh, yeah. And I wasn't doing super well in the races. And then once I started to get, like, talking with the teammates and was able to, like, connect with the staff and kind of integrate in the team like as an actual teammate and not just like the international rider yeah, yeah, yeah i was able to like start performing in races and then i realized okay like i can do this and they ended up giving me a stage year and yeah things went great from there but i think it all started with like really doubling down on french yeah yeah for sure i think for me i found like when i thought i could turn pro was when i realized i could like make a life for myself in europe and then yeah. the rest of it like sort of just followed naturally exactly right yeah um, so, which leads me in, so what's your favorite thing about being a pro? Like, you live in Europe, it's all, like, it's unreal life when you yeah. think of it. So, like, what's your favorite part? I think it's just that I'm, like, it forces me, or not forces me, but, like, I get the opportunity to, like, train and be outside my whole day. You know, I don't yeah, have yeah. to, and I can structure my whole day exactly how I want to. Yeah. It just gives you, like, a freedom and 
yeah, it's a really nice life just being able to like, I mean, you know, you can just literally, you have your training and you know what you need to do. And around that, you can do whatever you want. Like, yeah. you know, as long as you get the training done and it gives you a reason every day to go outside and like be out in the mountains every day yeah it's pretty special and have other hobbies and heaps to do during the day yeah yeah yeah. so then what is the thing that you hate most about professional cycling i know for me like i really struggled my first year pro when i finally made it and i was like this is unreal and then i sort of had like an moment like i'm away from my family for like the next 15 years intermittently yeah 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 no that's that i think that that could be it for me is like being yeah just away from the u.s and being out of your comfort zone for so long but it's also one of the positives but i think probably mostly what it is is like like it just forces me i can't have like yeah i can't like have the fun i I feel like i'm missing out on a lot of like the years yeah yeah. like my 20s or early 20s those college years that i don't know all my friends kind of have already gone through by now but, yeah uh yeah you just miss out on like a lot of i guess what this time in your life is and i mean i get to live a lot of other things that a lot yeah. of my friends <laughs> don't get to live but you know it's still like that that feeling of like okay am i missing out on like a lot of social things yeah. but it's just a sacrifice and i think it's well worth it so back home in america what's like the racing scene like there and how has it sort of been affected the last few years with covid but more in particular like tour of cali being cancelled and yeah. yeah it sucks uh i see the u.s scene as pretty yeah dying uh, yeah or like declining by a lot covid didn't help covid really kind of there was just a long stretch where a lot of races had to go away and then yeah. for those races to then come back and get like new sponsors and then renew with the sponsors yeah. it's a lot harder and i think cycling already before covid in the u.s was becoming a little bit more niche yeah and now after covid there's like very few races yeah. i see and a lot of guys are just struggling a lot of american bike racers are yeah. struggling so it's yeah not a great time and i think the missing those pro races does a lot like not having california not having utah or colorado yeah. it's like the there's nothing to watch there's like no there's nothing to aspire to as an american yeah. cyclist almost it's just like you either come to europe or yeah. you're in the u.s and you don't feel like you can make it but even during covid it was almost like intangible like you couldn't actually travel for, for, particularly for australians as well like we mm-hmm. couldn't if you were conti you couldn't leave the country so like what hope do you even have really Definitely. Yeah. So that's like sad on that front as well that it's just we were almost like the last generation I guess it got to experience like somewhat of like a local scene yeah. and now it's just basically gone. Definitely, definitely, definitely. I yeah. hope it comes back. I just don't know how to even help that. Or mm. <laughs> yeah. I know like one of the directors on my team, one of the American guys is uh who's like American British Italian yeah. Max Yandri. He like yeah, wants to make a race in the US and yeah, I think we you just need some professional races and then hopefully yeah. it can like trickle down from there and like kids can start watching races again and then getting yeah, out of yeah. bikes and hopefully that'll help. Of course. So a bit of a change of pace now. As a pro cyclist, we spend like an absolute hell of a lot of time in hotels, like yeah. moving places every day. What is your worst hotel that you stayed in or your worst nightmare? Yeah, I think what comes to mind is... Uh, as a junior, I did GP Rubland. Yeah. Did you do that race? No, nah, I've not done it. Uh, it was a race in Switzerland, and, like, <clears throat> I mean, they literally didn't house us in hotels. We basically stayed in, like, an army bunker uh, <laughs> the whole race. I'm not even kidding. We stayed, like, in the basement of, like, this, I think it was literally, like, an aircraft, uh, like, hangar or something. Yeah. And just underneath, there were just, like, bunks where, the like, the army would stay. <laughs> And it was so rough. I mean, we we shared a room, the Americans, we shared a room with, like, the Italian team, the Slovakians, like, the Polish. It was just the most wild experience I ever had. And, like, we were literally sleeping. Like, my upper bunk, I think there was a Slovakian kid. So it's just, like, you're, like, in there, like, changing, like, all the yeah, time. Yeah. It was a crazy time. And I remember, like, this kid Evan on my team, he, he would, like, try to talk to the Italians and, like, learn some, like, (laughs) sentence, you could say. (laughs) Some profanity. Yeah, really profane, yeah, sentence. It is crazy how we experience, like, different countries, though. Like, when I went to China, I'd experience it, like, no tourists would ever, like, stay in a hotel no one's ever seen before. (laughs) Like, toilets that you have to flush with a shower or, like... (laughs) 
just yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's really. And how about it's the opposite? Cool. What about the best? What makes a hotel great for a tour in your eyes? I think I actually like it when the hotels are like quite modern. I don't know why, but it's just like these old hotels yeah. really <laughs> just like get on my nerves. And old it's not carpet. even like it's not even like they're worse. It's like they're yeah, yeah. totally functional. But when the hotel is just super old and like everything's like creaky and just like it feels a bit more dirty and I feel yeah. like I'm gonna get sick. Yeah, something's on my nerves. I like it when the hotel's like recently redone. Yeah, you know? no carpet, nothing to wake up exactly. with hay fever. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> All right, so this one was hotly requested. During last year in Perry Roubaix, absolutely mm. iconic. You and I were in the breakaway together. Yeah, and then suddenly I pulled through and you weren't there anymore. <laughs> so tell us what happened there. Yeah, jeez, that was a brutal Roubaix. I, uh, I think the first, well, definitely the first thing that happened is I flatted right before Arnberg, like just on the road. Yeah, I flatted, and so I got a wheel change, and like the wheel change was so slow. I don't, I don't remember why the car was like really far back. Maybe they're taking a pee or something. Yeah. I don't remember, but it was super <laughs> slow wheel change. So basically, I got, I got chain like the wheel change, and they got me back going, and I was just like completely in the middle between the peloton and the breakaway and it was like i had a minute probably to get back to the the breakaway and probably only a minute back to the peloton and it was like well i'm probably not going to make it back to the break like i'm definitely not gonna make it back to the break so what i did is i just like tried to ride like tried to stay in the middle so i could enter the arnberg alone because i did not want to be in the peloton <laughs> yeah, for yeah, yeah. and i knew i wasn't going to make it back to the break or i'd have to kill myself to do that so i just rode arnberg alone and then I got in like the favorites group, and I think we caught the we caught you guys. Yeah. The and then I was like, "Holy hell! Like, I could get a result. Like, there were only like twenty guys. I was with all the favorites, and that was when like <laughs> as instantly once I started getting hope, I was like, "Oh no, no, no!" And basically, I just started getting like stomach like those feelings where it's like your stomach's turning over yeah, really yeah. quickly. And eventually just got to the point where, like, I couldn't eat or, like, I'd eat and I, like, felt like I wanted to puke it back up. And I, I was, like, eating all the time. It's obviously Roubaix. And I was eating, like, all sorts of whatever, like, you know, gels you grab and, yeah. like, drink mix. And it was definitely, like, super bad conditions for eating. 500 milligrams of caffeine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, too. A lot of caffeine. <laughs> and eventually uh, we got on one of the sectors. It was, like... I don't remember what the sector's called, but it was, like, kind of the ones in the forest. It was, like, really rough at the beginning. And, like, the sector was super bumpy, and it started, like, really jarring me enough to where it's like, I'm, like, actually going to poop in my shorts. <laughs> I'm going to shit my shorts if I don't stop. Like, I, I had no other option. It was, like, I couldn't hold it because my body was just, like, completely trying to get rid of everything in my stomach. And so I was just, like, waiting until... Because it's Roubaix. There's spectators yeah, yeah. along the whole <laughs> the whole route. Especially the, the Pave sectors. So I remember I, like, found... Like, there was a little section of, like, 100 meters where, like, the forest was super dense on the side. So people couldn't be there. And I literally just, like, pulled off my bike. Or I just, like, kind of steered off the cobbles into the forest and just fell off my bike. And just started, like, pulling my jersey off. <laughs> and our jerseys on Movistar are quarter zip. Because yeah, I want us to yeah, zip yeah. to the end. So literally, to get my jersey off to take it like a shit, I had to literally zip it, unzip it, quarter zip. There's a radio. I'm pulling the jersey off like this. There's like people there like running up to take video. Eventually, I do my business. I'm like down kind of in the grass, like in this really tall grass, like super deep in there. So no one could really see what happened. But yeah, I come back up and like all I have is shorts on and like, I'm sure there's tons of people with photos out there. Yeah. I haven't seen one yet. I don't know why, but like, I'm just completely, yeah, it was a bad experience. And my, and the car had gone by while I was doing it and they were like all laughing in the car. Oh, I bet they were. My team car, because Cortina was in the front, the front group and yeah. Something that happens to everyone once and unfortunately I happens. guess. It doesn't seem like it happens to that many people. Oh. But yeah, hopefully that was my last time. That I hope so too, man. Yeah. All right, so if you weren't a pro cyclist, what would you do? I know, like, you're really into adventure like me. Yeah. Off-season, you went for a ski trip into avalanche territory. Yeah. Stupid or not, I don't know. <laughs> what would you do? Uh, huh. If I didn't have to work, if, like, money just was out of the question, which would be the ideal, I would definitely just, like, be... I don't even know what you'd call it. I'd just be, like, an outdoor... I'd just be, like... I'd just be a bum. <laughs> an adventure. I'd literally just be a bum. And I'd just, like, in the winter... Living go, like, in your ski camper touring. Van. Yeah, I'd get a van and just, like... 
go like backpacking in the summer and ski touring in the winter and that's what i love the most is like being just like out in the mountains for yeah. sure it's unreal isn't it yeah yeah it's so good all right so now we got a few rapid fire questions from the okay. folk and reddit how do you deal with your sun exposure 40 hours a day being a ginger oh wow reddit <laughs> coming out swinging uh a lot of sunscreen i mean a lot of sunscreen and some some sunburns i mean yeah. i'm sunburned from today only Me rode two too, hours actually. today i got sunburned <laughs> no i mean a lot of sunscreen and uh limited sun sun exposure that's a good one inside the rest of the day <laughs> yep yep all right go to coffee order i usually go for a latte or just like a skin uh flat white i guess you'd call it and for the italians milk after lunchtime or not with your coffee yeah, yeah, yeah. no cappuccinos after lunchtime for the italians i don't drink coffee after lunch uh, if it's in the afternoon no, I don't, wise of you. yeah i can't sleep right so your team had a netflix show before you joined what is the general perception inside the team and do you like it i love it i think it was awesome i think it was probably the best thing our team has done as far as like marketing yeah goes. for sure i really believe that uh, I mean, within the team, it depends on, I guess, how the rat- how different riders are portrayed, uh, depending yeah. on their opinion. Like, some guys didn't like it because, yeah, they were portrayed badly or whatever. But uh, I really thought it was a super initiative. I, we aren't doing it right now, but I wish we were. And I think it's, like, what cycling teams need to do. Yeah. Like, we don't do enough stuff where we show what's going on. Like, that's what people want to see. Yeah. Like, more than just, like, watching dry bike racing and seeing, like, Twitter updates on like, yeah. how many minutes the break has. <laughs> we go again tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll see that kind of thing. But, no, I think it was really good. I, I personally loved it. So... Who is your best friend in Movistar then? And also, how do you get on with the Americans in the bunch? Yeah, my best friend on Movistar is probably Matthias. Yeah. Uh, he's pretty similar to me in a lot of ways. He shares my last name, so that's the first thing. <laughs> but no, he, he's a good kid, and I really like him. And he's a super funny guy, so I think he's my best friend on the team. And yeah, the Americans, great. Uh, yeah. Really good. I think, we all, I think all of us get along in a bunch. I mean, I wish, like... I wish we could spend more time. Like, we all live in different places. And yeah. A lot of these American guys live in the U.S. Like most of the time, so I don't yeah. get to see them except for races. But it'd be good to get to know them a little more. Yeah. And as for the interaction with a mate in the bunch, so say you're in a final really tense and you have to flick someone to get to where your team wants you to be. <laughs> yeah. Do you flick them and say sorry later or do you not go for the go for the move? You mean American or just anyone? Anyone, like anyone that's your friend. Like for me, I... Sh- oh, like, my friend. Oh. I, I'd struggle to flick one of my really good mates yeah, and yeah, say yeah. sorry after. I think it depends on a few things. How can... Well, yeah how much i want that gap yeah so if it's like if i'm doing the final for myself i'll flick pretty much any <laughs> <laughs> like if i'm trying to do it for my own result i'll flick anyone i mean it's a bike race and they'll flick me at some point yeah but no if i'm just trying to help a teammate depends on how much <laughs> i like the teammate i guess yeah yeah, I'll definitely say sorry afterwards. Yeah, you definitely strictly gotta put the, business. You put the arm out. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. Like, oh, sorry. I mean, you still flicked them. Yeah, but yeah. At least they know you knew you flicked them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So you're on the cusp of your first Tour de France. What are you expecting? Like, what are you looking forward to? And what are you really not looking forward to? I know we spoke a bit today about, like, the, the crosswinds. I don't yeah. know if you're looking forward to that. No, no. I think the things I'm not looking forward to are the first week. Yeah. I watch it on TV every year, and it's like, <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, there's, like, it's a probably mayhem. 50% chance you're on the ground. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? After the first week. And <clears throat> that I don't I don't want to crash, especially crash and then have to do two, two and a half yeah. more weeks of racing. Uh, but I really like to just be able to do the Tour de France yeah. and be able to say that I did the Tour de France. Because, like, as an American, as a cyclist, it's like – you're not a cyclist. You're not a pro cyclist yeah, listening yeah. to Tour de France. Yeah. So it's like, that's what I like Good to do. Good to tick the box. Exactly. Tick the box. <laughs> that's what I like to do. So the next one inside your team, you guys have Valverde. Our team has Gilbert. And during the tour last year, it was like a bit of a mentor. Like if Phil didn't care about something, I was like, I don't need to care about it. Yeah. Do you have like a similar sort of relationship with Valverde or? 
Uh, what you, didn't care about what in terms of like what? if Phil was like, uh, we don't need to be on the bus yet, or we uh, don't need to worry about something in the yes. stage. I'm like, where well, Phil doesn't care, I definitely really don't care. Hundred percent, yeah, yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I definitely, if I'm at a race with Valverde, it's basically what he says goes. I mean, it's like if you think <laughs> about it, like he's literally been racing as long as I've been alive yeah, as a professional. I, I, so it's like. <laughs> How can I argue with anything he says? Yeah, yeah. It just doesn't compete. I mean, there's just no reason I would have any more knowledge about yeah. literally anything than he would. So it's like, if he's saying something, yeah, no, it, it goes for sure. <laughs> That's good to hear. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, what will you do once your career's over? Have you thought about it? Uh no, nope. Don't want <laughs> to adventure think about in it. the mountains. Yeah, <laughs> really don't want to think All about. Right. It. Hopefully, have enough money to adventure in the mountains. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, good answer. Yeah. Thoughts on e-bikes? Someone wants to know whether it's cheating or not, but I mean, we spoke yesterday that you want to buy no an way. e-mountain bike. No way it's cheating. Dope, aren't they? No way it's cheating. Yeah. They're, the, they're the move. More That's... people on the bikes, the better, I think. 100%. Yeah. If I wasn't a pro, I think I'd have all my bikes e-bikes. Yeah. I mean, why? They go way <laughs> Why would you not? I don't know. Alright, and the last one... <laughs> So descending in the peloton, it's like we spoke about it. Like you just have to trust the guy in front that he's not going to end your life. Yeah. How sketchy is it descending in the Gruppetto? In the Gruppetto, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Gruppetto can be scary. I think the Gruppetto is a little better because you don't have like the same stress. Like you're going really fast, but everyone's just a little bit more relaxed. Yeah. So it's like we don't have to be anywhere. It's like, yeah, we'll, we'll go really fast. We don't have to go as hard on the next climb. Yeah. But it's like. You're not, like, literally fighting. It's not like there's people coming up, like, the inside of you and, like, you're not, like, jockeying for position yeah, at 80 yeah. hour. What I really hate is in the GC group when you're getting towards the bottom of a climb and it's, like, directly into another climb and you're just literally, like, six wide going into yeah. a corner at, like, however fast. And it's, like, <laughs> six of us won't fit through the corner. <laughs> Somebody has to break and nobody wants to. Yeah. And it's just, like, oh, this is so dangerous. Yeah. Like, it just couldn't be more dangerous. Yeah. But. I wish there was more Velon insights, honestly, into the descending. I think people would find it crazy. I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know why there's not more. <laughs> I mean, if you put a camera on some of my on my bike for some of these descents, it'd be insane. Yeah. I also don't want a camera on my <laughs> bike. I don't want an extra pound on my yeah. bike. <laughs> Me either. Yeah. Oh, well, that is the first episode of sharing a beer. Cheers, Thanks for dude. being on, Mateo. Of course. Thanks for having me. No worries, man. That was good. <laughs> I hope that bad boy recorded.